Mark 8. Mark 8. We, we finished last time on what is generally considered to be right before the climax of the entire gospel. Now, Mark, the author doesn't say this, of course. Mark doesn't say, oh, you ready for it? It says that if you read the narrative, most scholars will say fairly closely, you'll notice that Mark, I shouldn't say you notice, most scholars do believe, and I'm one of them, a, a reader, who thinks that Mark is generally divided in two major halves. There's a big peak in the middle. And why is that? Because it sure seems to be the case, as I've been emphasizing at least, a major emphasis in Mark's gospel is the identity of Jesus. Who is this guy? Who is he? Who is he? Who is he? The demons understand. God the Father's voice from the heavens understands, but humans don't. And this is, and then they, and then when people say who he is, he says, "What? Be quiet! Don't tell anybody." This is the one time in the entire text, the first time in the entire text, we actually does allow a human to say it, and so that's why many people think. That's one of the major reasons why this is the peak, but also because the narrative changes a good bit after this. Most of the teaching, exorcism, and healings of Jesus occurs in the first eight chapters. There's some later, but the teaching material changes a good bit. He's not, he's not gaining in popularity from now on. He's been gaining. And before I say that, more about chapter 8, we'll start in verse 27. Just to remind you, that is a key theme of Mark so far in Jesus' gospel, is that this guy is popular, but not everyone receives his message. They want to be healed by him. They want demons to be flee. They want to be healed. They want food and a fish fry. But when Jesus is starting talking about the kingdom of God and the parables and so forth, some get it. Some want to know more about him and come on the inside and say, tell us more about this. Some become his disciple. But many others don't. His, apparently his family members, Mark 3, think he's a bit crazy. Pharisees and scribes are against him. They think he's full of the devil. Uh, you have you, the identity given by demons, but they don't know who they don't follow Jesus. They just know his identity. So a theme, therefore, in Mark's theology is from Isaiah, which is they have eyes but don't see. They have ears but don't hear. So Jesus even he even has Jesus in Mark's parables. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. Remember that? At the end of Mark, what we ended last time in verses 22 to 26 is that, I would say, somewhat odd story. It's, it's unique in Mark's version uh, in gospel of a person who needs two touches to be healed. And most interpreters think Mark does this deliberately to say, you can see, but you got it. Jesus, you need Jesus' help to really perceive who he is. You need, it's not enough just to have the right identity. You have to know what I would say his job description is. Those two go together. So the man who sees the guys, I see people that look like trees though. Remember that last week at all? Does that ring a bell? Um, and that's in verse 24. And then again, he laid this out. Then he looked intently. And I'm, most interpreters, like I said, think Mark puts this here to say, this is what's about to happen in Jesus's life. The disciples can know his title but not his job description. They see him, but they don't really see him. And they don't want to really see him. Uh, and that's what's about to happen. So in Mark 8, 27, he goes his disciples to the villages of um, what we what we say in, from the Latin version, but Caesar, Caesaras uh, Philippi. So Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi, if you have a Bible map, is up north. It's one of the farthest northern regions of the Israel part, if you ever want to look at it. It's high. And Caesarea Philippi has a well-known uh, tradition of being a very Gentile pagan land. They used to do sacrifices there generations before this, you know, thousands of years. But it's an odd spot. He goes, the point of though, it seems to be the case, Jesus takes these guys way away from home. This would take them several weeks and foot journey to get there. He goes all the way up north. And on his way up there, we don't know exactly what he does when he gets there, this, the journey. Who do men say that I am? Now, in the gospel, we've been told a little bit already who they think he is, but he wants to hear the disciples say it. And they told him, John the baptizer. And Paul's there for a second. Remember who said that? Remember in 614? Who said that he was John the baptizer? Remember? It was Herod. And right before he heard John the baptizer, he heard about Jesus. And Herod has said, I think he's John the baptizer. Come back from the grave. Um, some think that. And back then, when I in Mark chapter 6, I told you, it could be that he thinks John the Baptizer is literally resurrected, but probably not. He probably, his idea is accusing Jesus. If someone said that, Jesus is John the Baptizer, it's like saying he's a magician. He's evoking the spirit of John the Baptizer to do his work. That's probably what was implied. 
that's false, right? He's not John the baptizer. He's not evoking the spirit of John. And others say Eliah, Elijah, which means Yahweh is my God. Eliah or Elijah is considered one of the greatest prophets in Judaism. His ending is ambiguous. Uh, is it in two kings or one kings? When it says he went to be with the Lord, he was no more. Well, there's no burial narrative of Elijah. So Jews believe that God took him up. Just He is what they call assumed into heaven, though he keeps living. And the assumption there that Jews developed was that God must have done that because before he comes back in full to usher in his kingdom of God, God's kingdom, Elijah will come again and tell people, time's up, here we are. So a lot of Jewish theological speculation developed over Elijah as this end time figure. Some say Jesus is like that. You are the Elijah who's about to usher in. Well, that makes some sense. Jesus is talking about the end of the, king, the kingdom of God. Time's up. Remember Mark 1.15? And others say you're one of the prophets. So you're a man of God. You're filled with the Spirit. That's a good thing. Remember, prophet just means spokesperson. Well, that's somewhat true. All these things are kind of true. He is like John the Baptizer in that he's demanding people repent of their sins. Remember that? John the Baptizer in the Jordan River, he told people to repent of their sins. So he's doing that too. He's like Elijah and he's ushering the kingdom of God or talking about the end of it. He's like one of the prophets because he speaks for God. The problem is none of these are exactly right. It's like the man who gets touched and he sees people like trees. You can kind of get it. And he gets a little angry. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? And the first time in the gospel, that's when he asked them directly. Now, Big Pete, who is probably, most interpreters read Peter to be the disciple's representative. Because in most of these dialogues, it's not so, very often it's not Jesus and the disciples sit down and have a conversation. Jesus typically speaks with Peter or James or John, but people tend to be the representatives for the whole group. And later on, we'll, I'll talk about that later on, and I think it's chapter 10. But Peter said, you are the Messiah. Now, you, your translation says Christ. Is that what it says, Christ? Christ. 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 And Christ and Messiah is the same thing. I, I say this every time, not to be silly, but to be serious. Christ is not Jesus' last name. It's, <laughs> it's not. It's not like David Pendergrass. It's his job title. Christos in Greek, Christ, Christos. And in Hebrew, it's Meshiach. Meshiach Christos, or Meshiach or Messiah, mean the same thing. One who is anointed with oil, a rub with oil on their head, to be God the Father's specially divine status emissary. In the Old Testament, one who is anointed with oil typically is a person who is king. But you can anoint uh, dishes. You can anoint things in the sanctuary. You can anoint things in the temple. You can anoint all these things. Uh, at one point in Isaiah, he calls Cyrus, who's a pagan king, the Meshiach, the Messiah. So what they don't seem to think is that Messiah implies God kind. If I said Laverne is Messiah in the ancient world, they wouldn't have said, oh, you must be deity or divinity, God kind. As far as we can tell, they wouldn't have thought that. They would have thought, you are, you share a very special, some might say unique, but a very special divinely given status that you have a job a very special god-given job to do and very few people in the history of judaism were called messiah or anointed and that's what he's saying that's what disciples we think you're the messiah we think that's who you are well let me say a quick thing about that as well another thing jews did not agree upon what the messiah would do in the old testament there's different kind of traditions form and by the time of Jesus' day, different Jewish authors were writing about this messianic figure. Some emphasized the messianic figure who would lead the Israel back to spiritual purity, get back on spiritual track, you might say. Others emphasize a military force. They're going to beat up whoever the bad guys are and get them. Uh, and that person tended to be a king, royalty. And those kind of be, tend to be the two major ideas of a messianic. Some might say more of an economic thing to help, help the oppressed and the poor and liberate them and so forth. What, so it's hard to tell exactly what any Jew believed exactly. Secondly, not all Jews believed in a Messiah figure, an end-time Messiah figure. They didn't. Some thought it was nonsense. So it's commonly said in church, though, that people say all Jews are looking for a Messiah, and they just were pining and pining. And historically speaking, that's false. Um, we have ancient literature, like the Sadducees, they weren't looking for a Messiah as far as we know. But there were groups of Jews who were. And they were looking for these Old Testament texts, um, like in Deuteronomy, and Moses says, uh, is it Deuteronomy 
is it 2014 or somewhere where uh, Moses says, one's coming after me is a greater prophet than I am. Well, Jews used to speculate, well, who's that? Well, some would say, we're still looking for that kind of prophet with a capital P. Some would say, that's a messianic figure. And others would say, King David said in 2 Samuel 7, a someone will sit from my, my lineage on the throne forever. That was God's covenant. They said, well, not anymore. Now the Romans rule. So there's going to have to be an end time king figure after King David himself who rules the Israelites and restores them, basically, restores them to their glory. If there's anything in common, it would probably be what I just said. Of all the different strands of Judaism, if you believe in Messiah, in essence, you might put the word royal restorer, kingly restoration. At minimum, that was it, to restore the nation of Israel back to its glory and prime, allow all the people been kicked out of home, all the exiles and dispersion, let them come back home, restore the grandeur of the kingdom at minimum. Some might add the extra and beat up all the bad guys, but at minimum, they would push them out. At minimum, the Messiah would help the Jews push out the bad guys to have their nation back. And that's what they say they are. He is. He is. And you would think the crowd would go crazy and Jesus would go, whoa, high five, Pete. Y'all nailed it because I am. Uh, and that's not all. Verse 30 is almost anticlimactic. He says, keep your mouth shut. And I'm people always ask, well, David, why does he do that? Most scholars think because of what he says next. It seems to be the interpretive key that unlocks why he's been telling all these demons and people to be quiet. Because he wants them not just to know his job, uh, his title, Messiah and so forth, but his job description. That is to say, you need to understand, for me to be Messiah, I will define it for you. And to be Messiah means I have to go to the cross. To do God's will, I have to die a shameful death. And... You need to understand how overwhelmingly problematic that was for the early Christian movement. That, As far as we can tell from Paul's letters and some from Acts, the number one stumbling block for every Jew who ever heard the gospel, they would say, probably paraphrasing something like this, yeah, 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 Paul, I hear you, but he died. Have you read your Bible before? Messiahs don't are not supposed to die. They're certainly not supposed to suffer. They're certainly not supposed to die by the people he's supposed to kick out. Brother, I hear you. I, I, you know, he, I sound like he was a good guy. My aunt got healed by him, but he's a loser. He was delusional. He got killed. That was the number one charge. What Paul called a stumbling block for the Jews was the gospel. So the huge problem for the early Jewish Christians was convincing these people that this Messiah, Jesus was the Messiah, even though these things happened. So Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John, and Paul, all the gospel writers and all the New Testament, they tend to say things deliberately to emphasize this was necessary. This was part of God's plan. And they'll say that here. They'll say things right here in verse 31. We'll say it in just a second. And he began to teach them. And here we're back to being a teacher. He hasn't really taught much lately in the gospel. Now he's about to teach them again. That the Son of Man, and almost certainly that means himself. Remember that, Daniel 7, this end-time figure? must suffer, must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests. And that probably means the elders of the Jewish tradition in Jerusalem, like the Sanhedrin, the Sanhedrin, that would be part of the elders and the chief priest. Chief priest would be Caiaphas. He's the one who helped get Jesus crucified. And the scribes, and these are religious leaders who help get in trouble and be killed and after three days, rise again. Now, here, he doesn't say crucified. At this point so far, he just thinks he's going to die. So we don't know if Jesus at this point knew he was going to be crucified per se, but certainly he was going to be killed. And he says, and, and on the third day, rise again. Um, and he said this in Greek, you might say plainly or really openly, that is, no more parables. <laughs> remember the parables in mark 4 hey why do you say all this to us? He says, i say it and he quoted isaiah so that hearing they may not hear blind they might that is it's judgment if you come ask me vanna comes says jesus tell me more i'm going to tell you but if you want to stay out there in the distance again he's gone crazy he's full of satan i'm not going to explain the parables to you so he's deliberately cryptic as a form of judgment on their hard-heartedness now that's not true he wants them to get this one clear as day and Peter does something incredible. He gives Jesus a big hug and a kiss and says, let's go to the cross. 
right? Like, and that Greek word is important. He began to rebuke him. That's the same Greek word Mark uses for Jesus when he rebukes the demons. Be quiet. Shut up. Knock it off. It's rebuking. Now, in Matthew and Luke, it actually says what he says. It says um, in Greek, it's something along the lines of like a, a mercy me or grace, uh, gracious no, Lord Jesus. That, that's never going to happen. But Mark doesn't tell us what he says except that he's rebuking him. That means Peter is telling Jesus, you've gone crazy. Stop saying that. Dude, you were on a roll. You said you're the Messiah. Let's do this. Let's go to Jerusalem, man. No, no, no. When I go, they're going to kill me. Peter, you need to understand that. But turning and seeing his disciples, he looks at all the disciples, probably because Peter represents the disciples. And they're all probably going, uh-huh, nod their head like, come on, Jesus, don't, you're smoking crack. He rebuked Peter and he said, get behind me, Satan. Now, what's interesting is to get behind in the gospel so far is to be his disciple, to come follow me and come after me. He wants you to get in line, but here he's telling, he's pushing Satan behind, get out, get behind me, Satan. Now, that'd be something to look for Jesus to look at you and speak to Satan. Isn't that amazing? Surely Peter didn't think he's speaking for the ways of Satan. Surely Peter didn't have his Bible devotional that morning and said, Dear Satan, speak through me today. I thought of this so many times in people in my life and in churches who I'm convinced are being speaking for Satan. And if they said that, that if you ask them, they're going to deny it. No, I'm not. Well, of course they would. Peter would deny it. Peter's got Jesus' best interest in heart. That's not going to happen, Jesus. You've gone crazy. Now, why is he caught from Satan? Because of exactly the content of what he says. That's how he knows. Not lit. It's so important. It's not because Peter has bifurcated tail and a pitchfork and horns. He doesn't turn red. He doesn't go, be quiet, Jesus. He doesn't sound great. There's nothing about that. In Mark's gospel, the reason why he knows it's Satan is because of the content of the sentence. Of what he's, saying. he's rebuking him. And he says, for you're not on the side of God, but of men. And we see here an abject failure on the part of the disciples. They have been with him. They've been sent on mission with him and for him. They have exercised demons. They have been against evil. Uh, you would think they see and understand, but don't. They, they halfway see. People look like trees. That is, they understand his title, but they don't see clearly. I'm going to say a lot more than that expectation, but I've said a lot in a few verses. Let me pause there. Any questions or comments? Good. Yeah. Uh, is that Deuteronomy 21, 23? Curse is the one who hangs on a tree that, that Paul has to deal with a lot in this ministry. He said, would Jesus have known that? And therefore, would he have, what was your question? Would Jesus have known of it? And then would he have, would he have known the scripture? Would he have known that he was going to be crucified? That's a great question. I have no idea. The gospels never mention Jesus or even allude to Jesus thinking of that verse. That I can think of. Mm -hmm. Additional, why this he failed, can't be. right? He can't. You, you can't lead us to victory when you're dead. So you That's a great question. To see how does you get a person to understand if if Jesus did die and he seems to have failed in that messianic expectation, how do you get him to understand it? it it's hard to beat the dead horse. I'll probably say this a lot, but it's true. to in my view, which is that depends on the person. I really want to ask them what it is they believe. Yeah. For me personally, the reason what I help a person do that is what I'm mostly concerned about, just in, as David Pendergrass, I'm most interested in what actually happened. I'm not first and foremost interested on Old Testament passages that might be interpreted a certain way. I want to start with what happened. So I'm asking, this is my interest, I'm asking historical questions. Did Jesus exist? Did he preach and teach these things? Does the historical evidence make it very probable that he died in a Roman crucifixion? Yes. Does the evidence suggest it's highly probable that some kind of resurrection event, event occurred? I think the answer is yes. Well, and this is very important. Because as an historian, I think these things are true. Therefore, I think we should be Christians because I think therefore Christianity is true. Then I ask the question, well, then why did he die and why was he resurrected? That is, I start from those what happened in history questions, then figure out these texts. What a lot of Jews do is, no, 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 no. I start with certain texts in Isaiah and Psalm or whatever and say, it can't have happened because of what Isaiah says. 
I don't find that. I don't. This, to me, that's cart before the horse. My mom used to say. I start with what really happened. Or let me use a modern analogy. If I, I I'm married to a woman named Elaine, and she's brunette from Florida. You go, no, 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 no. Wait a second. No, no, no. You can't be married to a woman named Elaine brunette from Florida. So why not? You say, because I know for a fact that everyone in Florida has blonde hair. Why do you say that? Because all the text I've ever read says that. It can't be true. What do you mean it can't be true? I just told you I can't be true. Well, what if I told you in reality I'm actually married to one? Can't happen. Nope. Because all the verses I've ever read says she has to be blonde. Which means either you're delusional or you're lying. Or you're just mistaken or someone lied to you. See, I don't find that convincing. I would say, what, what about if we start with what happens in reality? What if you meet her? Then you decide what to do with those verses that tell you otherwise. So with the, that's exactly what happened, seems to me. That's, that's not exactly what happened. That is not. And I wish it did happen that way to make it easier for me. But what Paul and the early church tended to do was not what I said. They didn't tend to say, they did not, they did not tend to say that, look, dummies, Jesus was raised from the dead. What else you want? They did talk about that. But instead what they did is they went to Bible verses that suggested this royal figure was supposed to suffer and die. So they used their own Bible. They used different verses. Some found that very convincing. Others did not. To this day, that is true. I know of really good, smart Jews who have read Paul and read the New Testament thoroughly. They know their Old Testament. They know their New Testament. and go, I hear the arguments Paul's making. I don't find them convincing at all. I don't think all people are born evil. I don't think any forgiveness by sins. I forgive... I, so that's how it was in Paul's day, right? Some bought in. It says that. that he'd go to whatever town. Some believe, some didn't. Um, the other thing I was going to say is, and I'm so glad you brought that up, and then I thought you were going to go a different direction, but it's related. Because I really, this is important to understand. This might be something, I'm not trying to be too technical, but this is really important to understand. As Christians, when every Christmas, most Christmases, you know, um, we do uh, Handel's Messiah, Right, the Messiah that everybody knows. That. Hallelujah! Ha! The, the big—that's the climax song, at least. Well, there's all kinds of all kinds of verses in the text, like the suffering servant passage from Isaiah 53, 52. He was wounded for my iniquities, bruised for me. Most Christians, I think, learn Isaiah from Handel's Messiah. They don't know Isaiah much. They realize, what do you mean, bruised my iniquity? What's he talking about? Well, he got that from Isaiah. Well, they are. They're called the suffering servant text in Isaiah and some in the Psalms of this idea of a figure who would be beaten and hurt for Israel. But here's my point. I'm not going to talk much about that unless you want to. My point is we don't have evidence in the time of Jesus that Jews read those passages that way. That is to say, and I hear this often in churches, David all these Old Testament verses pointing to Jesus, how could they not have seen it? And the answer is because they did not read those Old Testament verses like you do. They didn't. When we read ancient Jewish commentaries on things, we know what verses they like to use for messianic things. That's not it. It wasn't Isaiah. It wasn't Psalms. What most historians believe happened is the earliest Jewish Christians grew up in the synagogue, went to the temple, do those same verses, it wasn't until Jesus died and was raised again, they go, how do I make sense of this? And they went back to their Bible and they go, ah, all along, now I see it. But you see what came first? The chicken or the egg? What chicken or the egg? It was the chicken. He had to be raised from the dead first. That is to say, no one was scrolling through their old Isaiah and going, this must point to someone else. Or Malachi, right? or, uh, Micah, um, He's been born in Bethlehem. We don't have evidence that early, early Jews were looking for Bethlehem for the Messiah. Early Christians thought that probably because he actually was born in Bethlehem. Does that make sense? So that it's, the, it's the actual reality. And then look backwards in the Old Testament and go, those verses apply to Jesus. But if you don't believe in Jesus, those verses, they would say, no, they don't. I would think that as long as that's one of the reasons that they Maybe. It might be they were already looking for a king and found the verses that fit that theme. In their defense, they'd probably say, no, 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 because that's what the Bible says. Yeah. It says he's going to be a royal figure. But that's how Jews disagreed all the time, just like Christians do. They go to their, their Bible, their Old Testament, and it's their same Bible. Everyone reads all, well, then everyone reads it, but they've heard it in synagogue all the time. And certainly the scribes going to read it. And they're flipping through all the text. 
And some go, this verse is clearly about, others say, no, it doesn't. We know that's what happened because we have Jewish literature in between the Old and New Testament that was written. Like I said before, they didn't all agree on what the Messiah is supposed to do. Well, why is that? Because they pick different Old Testament verses to be the basis of their understanding. I saw a good debate. Uh, oh, that's a pretty good debate. I thought it was going to be, I was excited. Uh, a few months ago, it was on YouTube. It happened a couple years ago. And there's a well, well-respected New Testament scholar. Great. Against a, a real smart Jewish rabbi. And it was about, and I think the question was, was or is Jesus the Messiah? And I was really looking forward to this. Well, the Christian scholar gets up. He, and he did what I expected. He just gives us long, he get, well, it was long. He gives a synopsis of the various ways messiahs were understood in the Old Testament and what we call the intertestamental period in between the Old and New Testament, all the way up to the first, second century AD, roughly. So for several hundred years, when texts speak about the Messiah, what were they looking for? His point was, and he never said it just like this. I wish he would finish the whole talk and go, therefore, no matter what this guy's about to say, Listen carefully, because he's probably going to pick one or two views of Messiah and say, see, Jesus doesn't fit it. But what he should do is realize there are many ways Jews thought about what a Messiah would do. And if you look at the whole gambit of options, the whole dozen eggs here, Jesus does fit some expectations. And he didn't say that. What he did was the first part, which is he just laid it all, here are all the options and said, yeah, there's a lot of different options out there. Then the Jew came up and said exactly what we thought, which is he can't be the Messiah. Curse that one hang on a tree. Da 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 da. And he went on, on. That was it. The scholar was right in that historically that's the case. The Jew would say, I'm right because that's what Jews today do. We have our favorite verses to go to that show that Jesus can't be the Messiah. You didn't, that, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. But doesn't a lot of Isaiah point to Christ? A lot, a lot well, doesn't Isaiah point a lot of point to Christ? Well, we would Christ. say that now. But as far as we can tell, they didn't think that. Okay. As far as we can tell. I had read a um, certain verse. Or one word. Or, yeah, yeah. From the message. Or like their favorite, tra- whatever it is. Yeah, you're right. And that's a good example. Like in the future, let's say it's, you know, a thousand years from now, whatever it is. And people say, how could they not have seen it? All those years, they didn't read the Bible. But what happens usually, again, it's experience that makes them look backwards. Back uh, several decades ago, there was a big movement called liberation theology that really started in Latin America. And it was a real emphasis upon reading the, the, the Bible, particularly the Christian narrative, from the perspective of a person who was poor and ostracized and outcast. And so they'd go back to these verses and look up any single time God cared for the poor and say, how could y'all not said this? The whole, it's so emphasized this whole time. Well, of course, that's coming from people who are oppressed and poor and whatever. Uh, feminist theology. Feminist theology developed at the same time it did in basically in philosophical schools, so 60s and 70s. A lot of women come out. There's all kinds of commentaries where it emphasizes women, 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 women. They'll say, look at all this. Y'all have missed it this whole time. Other people, there's black theology who reads the Bible, looks for anybody who's not white. Well, no one is in this, but they'll say, they'll really overemphasize how Jesus wasn't white. How did you not see that? So every time someone that comes from experience, then reads backwards, they have a lens. And humbly, I would suggest that the best way to do is the best job you can is try to acknowledge you have a lens and then try to remove it. <laughs> That's why I got my degrees because I realize I'm a white male from North America and so forth, but I'm trying my best to read it as they did. But it's still impossible to do it fully. And I'm saying that's how they did now, and the, they do in the ancient world. When they read their Bible, I, I, many, most historians would concur that it's when the Jews said, we think we've experienced Jesus raised from the dead. We think we've experienced him in worship services. We think his spirit is speaking to us now. I had an uncle named Billy, and my son so-and-so got healed, and Fred got work from him, and he got he got forgave his sins, and now he's on our movement. We're calling ourselves the way. And, th- I mean, God seems to be really blessing what we're doing, but I don't understand this. How could he have died? We see this in the Gospels. Every disciple is duped by that. In Luke 24, when the disciples are going to the walk to him on, in Emmaus, and it says, we th- he, they're talking to Jesus, they're downcast, right? And they said, we thought he was the one to redeem or restore Israel. Everyone thought they had backed the wrong horse. They all thought he was a failure. Every one of them did. All the disciples, not just quote unquote downing Thomas, which is a bad rap, but everyone thought he was, they were wrong. No matter how good, what the good he did. So, so just like here, <laughs> it's a, uh, it never stopped. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. 
Okay, this is probably going to be skeptical. The only thing I can think of, yeah, that's a good point. I, uh, more than the only thing I can think of, honestly, to give the disciples the benefit of the doubt, though it's not much of a benefit, which is they simply did not grasp what he was saying. I think there's either two options, really. Either he never said this and the gospel writers are making this up, which I don't think is true, that, but that's logically that's a possibility. But I don't think that's true. Or he did say it, and the disciples went, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Hmm. Okay, let's go to Jerusalem. And I don't think, I just, I have a suspicion in the back of their minds, you might say, as we see through the gospels, they had a frame, a framework, hmm. uh, a, a model, a paradigm, and Jesus had to fit in it, but he didn't. And they're always baffled by it. Who is this guy who even the wind and the waves obey him? Who is this guy who's, why don't, and versus going, just fully trust him because he's so unlike anything I've ever experienced. Um, and even the son of man figure that he, Jesus alludes to himself in circumlocution, a roundabout way of saying to himself about himself. Even that figure he's referencing in Daniel 7, 14, 13 and 14, that figure is an end time figure. So even the disciples heard that and go, okay, let me, rec- let me find someone who knows Daniel 7. I'll look up in the Bible. They still go, yeah, but that guy's not supposed to be here yet. He comes at judgment day, right? So what's Jesus? I just saw me to fish. Like It doesn't make any sense to me. I just think they couldn't, they didn't grasp what he's saying. They just never, they had eyes but didn't see. They had ears but didn't fully hear. And they were still looking for a they guy know. to lead them into battle and beat the Romans. If there was... As far as we know, that's right. They're still looking for a more of And in all fairness, this political royal figure fit because, like we'll see later on in Mark chapter 10, he's called, like Bartimaeus calls him, son of David. That's a messianic, that's King David language. Well, he doesn't go, be quiet, I'm not that. Right? He doesn't do that. He, 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 he owns or allows these messianic royal titles and he didn't rebuke him. So if I'm a disciple and I heard someone say, hey, Jesus, King Jesus, come here, come heal me. And he didn't rebuke the king part. I might and go, well, Jesus does think he's king. Well, then I, I'm going to bring to that all my definition of kingship. Yeah. Yeah. Faith is... Well, in John's gospel, that was enough to convince them. It was. Well, it's, it says Thomas did. Others, it says, I believe, and some, some still doubted. Mm-hmm. There's a one quick expression in John's gospel, and some still doubted. But eventually, probably eventually, probably they all came to believe. It just might mean in that moment. After showing that, yeah. as far as... Seems to be the case. See, it strikes me so realistic. It just strikes me so... It just strikes me realistic. To, for something to be so otherworldly, so overwhelmingly different. I mean, it's just hard for the mind to really grasp. Like, I don't believe... I just... Anyway. Anyway. Um, so so if, I, if I think in blocks of material, if you look in Bible, verses 27 to 30... You might say, or his identity. That's who Jesus is. 31 to 33 is job description or what's going to happen, the mission. To be the Messiah means, to usher in God's kingdom means, I've got to be on my way to be killed and suffer. Verses 34 to 38 are our response to his mission. And this is really important here. And he calls to the multitude with his disciples. He wants everybody to get this. And and it's one of the reasons why I think this still applies to all disciples at all times. If Jesus wanted to say something just to the disciples like, hey, buddy, go get me some fish, it would have been different. But he pulls the mold. He wants the crowds. Everybody come listen to this. If any man, and he would mean a woman too, but he says it in the singular masculine as they often did, would come after me. That's a term, a phrase for discipleship. If you want to come out of the crowds and be on an inside group, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Let me pause there. Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. On the one hand, that is a literal thing. They literally crucified people. When you criminals are going to crucify, they would carry, I don't know the Latin for the word right now, but it was the, the horizontal cross beam. So literally, you're carrying that cross and follow him. Now, in that moment, Jesus didn't have a cross beam on him. But anybody in the time period would have known cross is not just a metaphor. People really got crucified. They really got crucified by the Romans. And that was considered in general, certainly by Roman authors, the most shameful death possible. Usually because you were naked and you were tortured to death for everyone to see it constantly. It's a constant sign. You were beaten. You are a wimp. Rome crushed you and so forth and so on at least at minimum 
that I can't imagine how difficult that would have been to hear someone you really maybe respect as a teacher and you're following, you're a multitude, you're in the crowd waiting to hear what he has to say. And then you say, you want my disciple? We're headed to a place where they literally can kill you. Then metaphorically, you might say, add to that, this idea that if you look for the principle, that is to be my disciple, you must be willing to die for my message. So denial here, denying himself, almost certainly does not mean not having a self. It doesn't mean just denying yourself ice cream. It means denying self-preservation instead of following me. To be my disciple, Jesus of Nazareth says, you have to completely give up self-preservation. Your instinctive to desire to survive at all cost, must be denied, abandoned. I have to come first. That goes back to Clay. Yeah, any kind of, that's right, I, I agree. Any kind of identity statement, uh -huh. who I am, I'm above that. You don't recognize who I am, I don't wash feet. And see, Jesus throughout the cycle, and that's in John, only in John's gospel does he wash the feet. Uh -huh. But here he'll do the same thing. We'll see later on, Jesus, his own passion narrative, what happens to Jesus becomes the paradigm for what he wants for disciples. When Jesus goes to the, Mark doesn't call it a garden. He calls it the region of Gethsemane. Matthew and Luke, they, I think Luke, they call it a garden. Anyway, he's in praying, God, Father, please take this cup from me. Not what I will, but what your will. So he denies himself and then will literally pick up his cross. Simultaneously in the place where he's being challenged to be, to, and people are spitting on him, beating him in the, the high priest chambers. While that's occurring, and he's claimed who he is. And we'll see this. I am. Are you, are you the son of the blessed, the most high? And he says, I am. That is, I am the Messiah. While he's claiming his identity, he denied his will to be preserved. He claimed who he really was, the Messiah. And that means going to a shameful death. As that is occurring, Peter's outside denying who he is. I'm not his disciple to preserve his life. So that contrast is on purpose. And Mark wants us to see... Jesus is the paradigm. He shows us exactly how to do it. He denies his own. To complete the kingdom of God in his life is to let go of any kind of self-preservation and to claim fully his identity, who he is. And that's how he says for you and me. If you said my identity is I'm a disciple of Jesus, you own that identity at all cost. That's what he says. For whoever would say, now the Greek word for life here, who would save his life, does your translation say life? Mm -hmm. it, it, it's the same Greek word, uh, bo, let's see, I think it's in both times. Um, da, 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 da. Yeah, it is. Verse 36, where are we at? I'm he yeah, same. So anyway, he's about to use the same Greek word for life, but he means two different things. One's like a physical life, and one we might call life of the new age or spiritual life. I don't like that word much. Whoever will lose, uh, here we go. So he says, whoever will save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake in the gospels will save it. So the point is, of course, if you were to die doing what you're supposed to do as the disciple of Jesus, you'll gain it. You'll gain a resurrection life. If you lose it for my sake in Gospels, you will save it. And that's exactly what Jesus does. That, that brings to mind a martyr, right? I agree. Well, that, and that's what's difficult for me. For me, it's difficult because, like I said a second ago, is that at minimum, Jesus is, means this literally. That is, you can go to Jerusalem and be killed. But after, after say, AD 70, the temple's destroyed, and certainly by the time Christianity becomes the legal religion mm -hmm. around 381, well, people aren't crucified anymore for being a Christian. Yeah. Um it happened throughout history. Uh, the Japanese were crucified routinely for being a Christian, mm -hmm. routinely. So it happens around the world that people are persecuted, but most Christians in the, around the globe won't die for their faith. That's right. And so what you're saying is, and then, and then by principle, by principle we renounce our life, lives every day. I, I think Luke's version of the statement helps us see that. If you look at Mark 8, 34, um, Anyone come after me, let him deny himself, take his cross, and follow me. In Luke 9, 23, Luke adds one word to it. Luke says, if anyone come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily. Daily. So Luke's version deliberately brings out the principle of it all. 
you don't go to the cross literally every day. Luke's version adds the word daily. Let us know is that's what you just got. I would say that's the way your statement fits perfectly. Luke's version of the saying more than Mark's. Okay. Did you say Luke nine? Is it Luke nine twenty three? Yeah. That's right. I'm going by memory, so I may have got the wrong one. But to say to all of them, if anyone wants to follow me, he must say no to the things he wants. Every day he must be willing to die on a cross. He must follow me. That's yeah. That translation is a little different, but yeah, it's yeah. the everyday part your translation was trying to get at daily or every day. Yeah. And so taking up our cross daily is. It seems to me. It means the daily decision to relinquish any kind of self-preservation I have for the sake of the gospel. I have to be willing to be overwhelmingly put to shame every day, all the time, for Jesus and his message. If I'm the lone person, if I'm made fun of, if I'm fired, if my friends and family cut me off, if my name is rubbed to the mud, what's that expression? I have to be willing to do that and not let go of Jesus. Okay. Every single day. To the point of even if that crowd killed me. Now this next part, Jesus gives consequences for not really grasping what he just said. Jesus really wants his people to get it. <laughs> for what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? The point is, if you lose it all in the end, and of course this metaphor, you gain the whole world, but you lose it all, what profit? The answer is, of course, nothing. That's a good economic term there for profit. What's the return on investment, the ROI? <laughs> Verse 37, for what can a man give in return for his life? Of course, the answer is nothing. You can gain it all. You can have self-preservation and, re- and gain all the stuff you want and accolades and whatever. But in the end, at judgment time, you will lose your life. Life of the new age. Life of the new age. So if you don't save your life by losing your life here, physical life, you will lose it by God at Father at Judgment Day. Verse 38, why is that? Because whoever is ashamed of me and my words and this, and he means religiously adulterous, right? People who have all kinds of different gods and sinful generation. Of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Good heavens. This is ast- I mean, it's astonishing. Jesus is saying, as I've said before, I mean, there's no, I don't know how people get around this. People, all religions say the same thing. And no, I, no, they don't. Jesus just looked at a bunch of people and said, how you decide to do right now and your obedience to me is how it will be at judgment day for you. You reject me, I will reject you. You follow me, you're going to make it in. It's, he didn't point them to Leviticus. Go back to the temple. Go back to a ritual system. You're looking at the guy. I don't know how to say. He, he didn't say here, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, but he just about did. I mean, you know, that's how John says it. And John's Jesus. And he says, if you're ashamed, I'll be ashamed. Now, what's so scary later on is Peter does exactly Almost word for word, what Jesus says, don't do. He's ashamed to be associated with Jesus, and he uses self-preservation to save his life. Very, very afraid. And later on, to a very good word of afraid, because in a little bit of, in Mark 13, Mark Jesus is going to address, I'm convinced, the fear when he says, don't worry or be concerned about what you're going to say, because the Holy Spirit will give you words to say when that time comes. Now, we'll see in Mark's gospel, even... He gives, he gives another chance for Big Pete. Pete has another chance. But just let's, let's, let's soak in for a little bit. Remember in the context, the disciples are there. We think you're the Messiah. Great, but don't tell anybody because it's so crucial. I want people to understand that before you start going telling the world, Jesus is the Messiah, he is the Messiah, you need to know what my job description is. You know what my next mission is. Yes, I've come to usher in the kingdom of God. Yes, I am the Messiah, you're exactly right. But you understand my, my messianic role is to be obedient to this message even when they're going to kill me. You cannot see my death, my shameful death, as a sign that I'm not the Messiah. Until they're ready to die for that fact. Until you're ready to And that's faith. Yeah, that's the faith. Okay. 
No complacency allowed. Man, no compl- I mean, that's to me, it's one of the most haunting. There's a lot. One of those haunting passages in all the New Testament. Yeah, no complacency. There's no. There's a TV show I've been watching on Netflix more lately. If you know what Netflix is, it's a TV channel kind of. And uh, there's a show in there that's a, a real life documentary drama thing of people who are trying to make it in the business in Hollywood, and they're they're musicians, they're singing, and almost every single person in the show is gay or polyamorous, which means they had a lot of lovers, or they're I mean, it's just all it's all the pagan like the, today's episode was the two guys who got married and they were just making out and. And one said, um, he said at the, when he was holding a guy's hand to get married, he says, I prayed for years and years and years that God would take away me being gay, but I realized he didn't so that I would find you. And they all cried and hugged and kissed. And, and I was thinking that mixed with a bunch of other stuff goes on in the show. And uh, I watched some of these shows, part of it, because I love, I love behind the scenes document. I love that. But also, really, I watch these shows from time to time to see what's out there in the real world. Because I don't live in California. I don't live in, the, I think they're in Hollywood. I don't live there. That's a whole kind of dynamic in life. I know that. I'm trying my best always to be as informed as I can so it helps me minister. I was thinking t- today, in fact, this morning when it was on, about 30, 40 minutes, and I was thinking, how would I share the gospel with people like that? And these are nice people. They seem to be nice. One guy is a raging alcoholic. Another person has all these issues. One woman was raped. It's I mean, they're wounded, hurt people who are trying to make it, trying to make it big, trying to make a name for themselves. They're trying to save their life. Back to Jesus here, right? They're trying to gain the world and get validation and get fame. And then how would I share the gospel? And I was, I mean, I was thinking about that, how to build relationships with them. And I was thinking, imagine where the word came out. And I'm in the room and, and my time to sing, and I start singing, calling about Jesus or something. And I find that I'm a Christian. I wonder what would happen. I wonder what happened in the room. Oh, he's just, and they, all the assumptions would come about what I believe, how mean I'm going to be to the gay or whatever, all the false, horrible judgment that's going to come. And I was thinking about how to do that and how I was just kind of fantasizing because that's what I do when, I, when I'm at the gym and I meet, tell people about Jesus there or wherever it might be. And, I was, and I, I'd forgotten in preparation for tonight, this is the passage we're doing. But I was thinking the same thing. What would it take to be, it, you'd be shameful. I mean, that is to say, it would be a shaming experience in that environment to be a person who is outspoken about the message of Jesus to say, how would you talk about? Well, you just think we're all going to hell. Well, I don't know where you're going, but well, what's wrong? I love people. I love him. What's wrong? I mean, I could just hear that coming on and on to say, I don't have an opinion about that. Jesus does. And I follow him. And I know that might hurt your feelings, but you know, I love and care for you. And I was just kind of going through that and I'm not about to be killed. Like the worst case scenario is they might yell and cuss at me. Right. I mean, that's the worst case scenario. Maybe pull out some things and throw a cell phone at me, but not really. But you know, but this is the kind of stuff that should, ha- in my opinion, should haunt us as Christians. To say, when I'm at work, I'm at home at the grocery store. If we shrink back at the slightest little, they might. What would they say? Mm-hmm. I mean, Jesus said, verse thirty-eight: Whoever's ashamed of me and my words, yeah. and not a bunch of good people. I heard the other day. Uh, well, we were talking about the last time, right, Laverne? What about good people? What about people who are good who not heard Jesus? And so I hear that oftentimes. And I said several things, but one is people aren't good. I, and Jesus didn't think that. And I think of verses like this in verse 38 of this adulterous and sinful generation. Jesus did not walk around saying, we're all pretty good people. Let's just do better. Or I need you to believe in God. Or I know there are worse people in the world, but you see, he doesn't say that. He doesn't have all high hopes for people. He said, David, things are different. I don't think they are. I think if he were today, he wouldn't go, okay, now we're all on much better. Uh-uh. No, you know what I'm saying? I don't know. I think we back I think we <laughs> But So that helps informs us as disciples when we think of the world. And that includes ourselves before we come to Jesus. But when I see people at the gym or I see people at the grocery store, I don't assume they're good people gone astray. I think they're an adulterous, sinful generation who need Jesus badly. And they might do some things well, and they might be loving people at times, absolutely. But just because they do those things doesn't mean for one second they've given their lives to Jesus. And that ticks people off. Make no mistake about it. Just leave all this religious nonsense out of it. You may not deal with a lot, but I talk a lot with skeptics, and it, it makes them angry. We can. Yet why do you have to bring in religion on it? You're all the ones that cause all the wars and tell me what I do, and you're so judgmental. You just get a shameful thing. At this point. Yeah, you've been a friend for like 25 years. 
Is that rhetorical or are you really asking yeah. me or something? Yeah. Cause I mean, ultimately, I, it's a great question. And you, we've talked a lot about this. Of course, Christians should, our default stance should be love. Loving, acting lovingly to everybody. Or to use a medical analogy I use at the time, our bedside manner should be phenomenal. We should be so sweet and as best as we possibly can. Even if we don't tell them they have cancer or whatever the disease is, we should be always kind to them. It's just that in these kind of verses, it seems to me, we can't be afraid they, to say they do have cancer if the this, this situation arises because we're afraid of their response. If a doctor says, I can't tell you how I really feel because you'll make me feel ashamed, you'll make fun of me, you'll hurt me, you'll yell at me. If there's a time for me to tell you the diagnosis, I've got to tell you. But every doctor doesn't walk to every single person all the time. There's a time and place for it. But Jesus' point here is we can't be afraid of the diagnosis or he will be, he'll say, I'm not, I'm going to have to do with you. You can't be afraid of following me no matter what. Now, and remember in my second, so those are the two things together. Jesus did not walk around naming everyone's sin all the time. I'm not sure why so many Christians think it's our job to walk around and name myself. <laughs> What he did walk around was lovingly compassionate to people. And secondly, when it was needed, he did tell them the diagnosis. And of course, he'll keep saying it eventually he'll get killed for it. As that ties in to answer your question, ultimately, I don't know if it's enough because, of course, God would know that I would know. Humanly speaking, the short answer based on what I think is the Christian response is, our number one responsibility is to behave lovingly to them. Two, do our best to introduce them to Jesus. To Jesus. We present Jesus in a winsome, kind, normal, for our culture, way. We don't act like a lunatic or a crazy person. So we're loving. We present him to Jesus. He always brings Jesus up to me. Great. So we, I mean. Right. So, you know, we always talk. No, no. I think those two things are very important. The third thing I would say is, and this might be the the last thing I would say is, I don't know if you've done this. If a person, especially if they're a believer, then you do have number three as a right. You don't necessarily have to do it, but it is certainly within the, I can point you to verses that say, yeah, you should. If they're not a Christian, number three may not come in ever. And that is, it's okay at some point, if you have a relationship, to point out how that, in the verses repeatedly mentioned, that's a, an egregious sin. I wanted to, honest, I have. Well, in that case, you know, and, just, uh, and it seems to me in the New Testament that is typically done when they're. It's well, first off, it's always done between Christians, unless God has inspired a prophet to speak to a non-Jew or non-Christian. That's different. But in the Christian community, it's Christian to Christian. Paul Paul says in one Corinthians six that we are supposed to judge those inside the church that is condemned behavior. But that's Christian to Christian. And the assumption is in a church, you know each other. What about this guy? Well, if he claims to be a believer and one day you're, and you have, you've already built the relationship, he knows you love him, he loves y'all, well, shoot, maybe have a coffee one time and say, I'll maybe only bring this up one time, but I've, just, I've been praying for you a long time and so forth. Uh, how do you deal, maybe a good question is, how, what do you do with those passages? Ask him. What do you do with those passages throughout the Bible, certainly the New Testament, uh, that speak about human sexuality. And if I were you, I would stick on one major thing. And it's Ma- Matthew, Mark, Mark 10, Matthew 19, Luke, whatever. But I like Matthew 19 because it's the fullest treatment. That's Jesus. Instead of bringing up Leviticus and bringing up all these texts, they're going to say, that's old. T-. In Matthew 19 and in Mark 10 and Luke something, Jesus speaks specifically about in the context of divorce, Jewish men were looking for ways out of marriage. He talks about the purpose of marriage and the purpose of, and, and he doesn't use this word, but this is exactly what he would have meant, which is sexuality. In the ancient world, marriage was basically to have children, to have a family. And so when he says, don't have you read from the beginning, God created male and female, male for the female, and what God has put together, let no one separate. Mm-hmm. So my question to your friend would be is, what do you do with passages like that? And I'm asking lovingly. I'm not here. Th- I, I, mean, I, I say this. I've said to people, I have no stones in my pocket, you know, metaphorically from right. John said. I, I'm curious what you do with that. But my second point, and I would put all my cards on the table, my second point is I am curious what you do with that. And if you want to talk, we'll talk. If not, fine. But my second major point is 
I'm very, very concerned for you. And why am I concerned for you? Because there are passages that say, like 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10, that people who practice what you practice do not inherit the kingdom of God. What do you do with passages like that? And then I shut up. Then I get quiet. Yeah. And I'm really listening. Right? I'm really listening. That's what. I, so it seems to me if you've done that third thing with a fellow Christian, that is the last possible thing you can do. I mean, of course you keep praying. But as far as dialoguing with them, right. there's nothing else to be done. Because, right, you can lead it to the water all you want. No one's going to... Right. Can't make him. Yeah. And, I'm, and also to encourage you, because this is common in Christianity, a lot of Christians feel guilt if I didn't get them to stop that thing. And you don't need to feel guilt for that. No, I, I, don't, Good. I don't feel guilt. I wouldn't feel that burden. I wouldn't no, feel the... but I mean, he's a ancient. It's now, true that Christians have to get better informed yeah. at being able to articulate what it is they believe in a very loving, kind way. And ideally, what they believe is what Jesus believed. And for Jesus to come along and say, at its core, to usher in God's reign and God's rule means you've got to repent. You've got to reorient your life to whatever he says, which means anything you do and say that's not what he said, it means you're wrong. And you know what? No matter what it is. And that's not attractive to everybody. And right? it's not just them. Yeah. yeah, Lawrence, almost no one has ever waited for us to finish to say amen. That really? Uh, really stood out in Texas and everyone in the South. Everybody waits. Waiter waitresses. I have never had. I think one time, one, well, as a kid, a couple times, they go, Oh, I'm sorry. But here, all the time, what brand? Heavenly Father, here are those napkins. All the time. Oh, it happens all the time. It happens all the time. It happened yesterday. We had dinner. Someone gave us a gift card. We went to dinner. And, oh, are you managing? Here's a plop, plop. Uh huh, thanks. And then we go back to. <laughs> I've never so, seen so Oh, good heavens, heavens. <laughs> well, in any case, um, but no, I, I appreciate it. just to that is this is a good it's a good real world example of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus and be able to articulate what it means to have gospel good news. What's good news if you think there's bad news and if you think you're all good and everything you do is good, then this doesn't make any sense. And we in Jesus's encouragement and challenge and explicit claim is if you're scared to talk about that demand with people because of what they might do to you then you're not fit to be his disciple. You're just not fit. If I were to tell a physician, oh, I just can't, I got to go tell them they're sick. If you can't tell people they're sick ever, you're not fit to be a physician. You're not fit for this job. And that's what Jesus is saying about discipleship. If it never can come out of your mouth because you're afraid of being ashamed, you're ashamed of me, it's, it's, you're not fit for it. And you'll see that's what happens. Those people are too afraid of that. They will leave Jesus in a heartbeat because this changes everything. This, is, this teaching is head in God, Mark's gospel as unlike anything he said before. And all of a sudden, you'll really see things get real difficult. need to give him some verses. Well, maybe so. And I, I'm, not, I'm not telling what you do because I'm not. But, you know, I was thinking, but it, if someone said they loved me and they were convinced I was sick and I didn't see it and they didn't tell me, that hurt my feelings a lot. They might tell me what they thought the sickness was, and I go, oh, no, I disagree with you, or you're delusional, or I don't have the sickness. But at least I know from your perspective you thought I was. And if you just gave me some pamphlets on it, I would feel like we're not that close. That's to me, that's, to me it is. And that's how I would say to people. I'd say, is, I love you. I care for you. Yeah. If I didn't love and care for you, I wouldn't be sitting down talking about this. You might disagree. Okay. But I don't disagree. I think Jesus really knew what he was talking about. Yes. And so I'm just concerned for you. And so what do you do with that? And how can I help? Is there anything I can do to help? Or um, that's the kind that of, I, I would. And again, like you've said, after the built a relationship, I said, my brother-in-law has done a good job with that over the years. He's a pastor. And he'll, he'll find it on Facebook someone now is gay or as a partner or whatever. And he'll call them. He hadn't talked to them in years, but maybe they were in his youth group years before. He was a youth pastor for years, and now he's a senior pastor. And he'll talk to them on the phone about it. What happened? And what up? He'll just talk and talk and talk. And that didn't always work. Sometimes it does. Sometimes, but he's very loving and kind. He says, I love you. I love. That's why I'm calling you right now. What, what are you doing? And what's going on? How can I help him pray? And well, I just this this and. But he knows his Bible, so he's able to. But he doesn't just. He's not throwing the book at him. You know, he doesn't. He's not cussing, and yelling. And, You're going to hell. And doesn't call him names. He he just showers it. They might not always feel love, but he just says it very lovingly. He's being very kind about it. He says he loves Laverne and I. Yeah, I'm sure he does. I'm sure he does. I've been pretty, been I'm pretty sure he does. blunt with him, but... And he came to me about every day I was sick, you know, got out of the hospital. That's so thoughtful. He's there just about every day. 
Well, I'll pray that God has mercy on him like he has it on all of us. And I hope and pray that God gets all his life in all of our lives. And Van, of course, is exactly right that when we talk about this with anybody, I prefer to use the word we, like God designed us and we ought to follow with Jesus. We, we, we versus you. And to help dis- diminish how much there's a you versus us, you know, it's us mentality, not a you versus me mentality. And I think that helps a lot, goes a long way. But also, secondly, keep talking about Jesus. Don't talk about the church. Don't talk about your opinion. Talk about Jesus. Let Jesus do the talking. And that's why I asked the way I did, which is, what do you do with the things Jesus said? I struggle with other things Jesus said. I can tell you what they are. I don't struggle with that one. But what do you do with that? But but the difference is, though, brother or sister, is the verses I struggle with, I struggle with them because I know he's right. That's why I struggle with them. That is, I know I'm in the wrong. I'm not embrace something he's against. I'm trying to deny something he's against. And I'm trying to support something he's for. How do you knowingly embrace something he denies and he's against? And that's the distinction. So that's how do you do that? And how can I help and support you? And I'm concerned. And, and maybe that's a good dialogue. I mean, like long term, maybe it's not. Um, but I pray for God's wisdom on that. Whatever it is, I think God will give you peace and wisdom when to bring it up, if he wants you to, really. But whatever it is, I think Jesus will say, whatever it is, don't ever, don't ever not do it because you're ashamed of me. Oh, no. Right? That's all of us, right? That seems to be the message yeah. no matter what. Let me say a prayer for us again. We'll wrap it because it's already been an hour and a half, and we'll wrap it for us. Uh, we thank you, Lord Jesus, so much once again for teaching us. Jesus, I think I can speak for us like Peter did for the disciples and saying this stuff is is tough. And when we come to grips even a little bit of how powerful these verses are, we realize that we have to fully surrender. God, we need your help for that. We need your, not just help, I guess. We need you to do it through us and for us. We like self-preservation. It's easy for us humans to put trust it's easy to put our trust and f- so God help us Holy Spirit in those times it's easy for us to want to preserve ourselves and to, as Jesus has gained the whole world and put our trust in things we've garnered we've collected help us not do that God help us not do that help us be people like you who you were overwhelmingly loving and kind and respectful and to people who didn't know you, but people who are interested a little bit, man, you were so incredible, and you always spoke the truth. As Paul said, Paul said, help us speak the truth in gentleness. But uh, just reflecting on tonight, in particular, Lord Jesus, help us never be ashamed. Never ever make decisions because of the fear of being ashamed. We don't want you to be ashamed of us when we see you, and we will see you, of course. Lord Jesus, help us as well have wisdom when we talk to other people, both Christians and non-Christians that we were people who first and foremost act lovingly or first and foremost people who are kind and that they want to know more about you because we've been, they've been so overwhelmed and smothered by our love that it, it correctly colors the way they hear the message of Jesus. Help us do that and do that well. That's, e- that's not easy to do, Jesus, sometimes when we find people who seem to be so against what you taught and they live lifestyles that are so different. And maybe some are just so new, we don't understand and don't grasp it. Please help us process those feelings of fear and anxiety we might feel and not be driven by those fears, but by driven by the desire to show your love and to speak about the gospel and speak about repentance. Holy Spirit, just as Vanna said or implied, Lord, help us do it through us. Please do it through us that we too, you keep getting our act together. You keep cleaning us up no matter what. Uh, and Jesus, oh God, we thank you. This Thanksgiving weekend that's coming, this week that's coming up, we thank you, thank you, thank you. We have so much for which to be grateful, and we thank you for all that you've given us, food and clothing and warm, on and on it goes. God, we praise you and thank you for being such a good God. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.